Let's get right into it. So I think this first question is pretty good, especially considering it's one of my biggest losers today. So the question was regarding Futu, the general, the general public owns about 16% of the shares outstanding. I'm, I, by the way, all data is just from people submitted, not me. I did not double check this. Uh, it says regarding Futu, the general public owns about 16% of shares outstanding and 81% of the company is owned by the top 25 shareholders. How does that make you feel as a long-term investor? I don't see anything wrong with that, to be honest. I mean, you want heavy institutional ownership. Uh, I mean, I think if you, I mean, let me pull up food too, so I can just go through the numbers and and be correct here. But I mean, just off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure the founder owns at least thirty percent. I want to say, and then ten cent, I think, owns another twenty twenty five percent. And then you're obviously gonna have institutional owners. I mean, to be honest, everything that's happened in the last couple months with small caps or growth stocks. I would prefer to see more institutional ownership and less retail ownership because it's the heavy retail ownership stocks that have been smacked around the most. Got it. So this... let, me, let, me, let me pull up the numbers and just make sure that that's correct because I don't look at this stuff every day. Um, the founder owns 35%. I mean, this is, I don't know when this data is as, but it's probably pretty accurate. Uh, it says the founder owns 35%. Tencent owns just under 22%. And then you have a lot of institutional investors. You still have some of the VCs in there, although it looks like a lot of the VCs have already reduced their ownership stake. Um, looks like Matrix has sold about 75% of theirs. General Atlantic has sold 31% of theirs. And that makes sense. I mean, the VCs don't want to be in these investments forever and ever. At some point, they have to exit those positions and return that capital to their their limited partners. So, yeah, I have no problem. And then you can see, like, uh, if you look, I mean, and just so everyone knows I'm on simply wall.street. That's the website that I go to. And there's other websites. I mean, even ticker.com gives you the inside ownership stuff too. This is just the first one that I go to, but it looks like Goldman Sachs has, uh, increased their stake dramatically. It looks like JP Morgan has increased their stake. Uh, a few other hedge funds I've never heard of before. Renaissance, Two Sigma, um, Susquehanna. So yeah, I have no problem with, uh, heavier institutional ownership and hedge funds and less retail. I think that's actually a positive, not a negative. Got it. Like it. Um, okay. Next question. And also just real now, quick. Now, let me, yeah. let me follow up. I, I don't know why Futu is down 15% today. Uh, you know, is just as simple as growth is selling off maybe, but that's obviously a bigger hit than a lot of other growth stocks. I added to my position today. Uh, Futu is my second largest position. They report earnings next week. If anyone remembers correctly, they grew revenues at about 213% last year. They're expected to grow revenues at at least 115% this year. Uh, gross margins are in the high 50s, like 58%. Net income margins around 48%. Um, and, you know, I've said this over and over. I mean, it's almost impossible to find another company, uh, not only with a total addressable market as large as what Food2 is going after, but you know, to back it up with the fundamentals, the growth, the profits, they already raised capital last quarter. So we're not going to get a, another capital raise anytime soon. Um, so I, I think this is a tremendous buying opportunity. Like I said, I had some cash come into my account today. So I actually bought more food too. I, I increased my position in upstart by about almost 30% now from what it was going into yesterday. And it was already my biggest position yesterday. So some of the cash that came in today, I added to those two names along with a few others. I added to Durham Tech and Celsius that both report earnings tomorrow. I added to ClearPoint, which reported last night, some great numbers. I added to Desktop Metal, which reports next week as well. Um, you know, Upstart, I mean, since you might have a couple of questions on Upstart, um, since it's my biggest holding, I'll just talk about it because we got numbers last night, which blew me away. And I mean, there was a good reason why the stock was up 20% after hours yesterday and 26% this morning. I didn't trim any, I didn't take any profits. I could not care less that the stock has pulled back. And now it's only up 1% on the day because it gave me a chance to actually bring down my cost average, believe it or not. So now my cost at my cost basis is uh, mid nineties. Uh, I think this is an easy $200 stock by the end of this year. So just to catch everybody up, uh, Upstart is an AI-powered underwriting platform that partners with banks. 
to do uh, personal lending and also now auto lending. They did an acquisition in Q1 of a co company called Prodigy, which builds uh, software for auto dealers. So it's a perfect kind of segue for Upstart to work with those auto dealers and plug in their AI model or a their AI lending model for auto loans. Um, Upstart, when they reported Q4 earnings, uh, they raised 2021 guidance to 500 million. And then they reported yesterday and said that revenues for Q1 was up 90% year over year, but they raised their Q2 numbers from about 117 million to 155 million, or at least you know they, they gave a range of 150 to 160. And then they raised their 2021 guidance from 500 million to 600 million. And my guess is they're probably not done raising for the year. So, you know, if they're comfortable raising from 500 to 600 already, and we're only, you know, five months into the year, they probably have some really good visibility on what's going on. So my guess is lend, auto lending is going really well. It sounded like it was on the call. And I mean, if you listen to the earnings call, which I've listened to twice now, uh, and I'll probably listen to one more time, uh, I mean, they are extremely, extremely bullish on everything that's going on. Contribution margin is going higher. Um, conversion rates are up to 22 percent, which is much higher than what they expected. And they said because conversion rates have gone up to 22 percent, that now enables them to uh, spend even more money on marketing. So everything's going well at Upstart. I mean, I them raising 2021 guidance to 600 million. And like I said, I think they probably end up doing 650 to 700, but even at 600 million, that's somewhere between 157 and 158 uh, percent year over year growth from 2020 to 2021. That is ridiculous growth for a company that's also profitable. I mean, if you remember when, um, when Snowflake, <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the, I shouldn't even laugh about this, but when Snowflake came public, right, that was like one of the hottest IPOs we've ever seen because their growth rates were ridiculous. Um, you know, gross margins were good, but they were losing a shitload of money. I'm sorry. Upstart is growing faster now. They don't have quite actually. Yeah, I think revenues are actually going to be more than than. Hold on. Let me look this up because now that I'm actually now I actually want to make an argument out of this. So Snowflake. For estimates this year, okay, yeah. So their revenues are actually no, fuck that. The revenues aren't even higher. Sorry. So estimated revenues this year for Snowflake are five ninety two. Okay, I don't follow Snowflake, so I don't know if that's. I mean, that's clearly the consensus midpoint. So I don't know what the highs are, but looking at Snowflake right now, which has a market cap of fifty eight billion dollars. Expected to do revenues this year of 592 and revenues next year of 1.1 billion. So this year's revenue number would be 123% year over growth. Next year's 1.1 billion would be about 85, 86% year over year growth. The company is also losing a ton of money. EBITDA margins this year of minus 36%. Uh, net income margins this year of minus 37 percent next year, you know, chop those numbers in half. So, you know, minus 17, minus 18 percent on EBITDA and net income. Now, if you look at Upstart, Upstart is growing faster. OK, and then gross margins on Snowflake is 65, 65 percent gross margins. Upstart is now going to grow at 158 percent. They're going to do more revenues than Snowflake, at least on their current guidance versus the estimates that I'm looking at right now. Uh, gross margins for um, Upstart are 84 percent. Contribution margins are like, I think they said 45, 46 percent. Um, and they're profitable. Um, and, and, up, and now Upstart's market cap is like seven billion, not even seven billion. You know, and then you back out some of the cash enterprise values under seven billion. So I'm just like, I would love someone to tell me why Snowflake is worth, um, what, nine, nine times more. Like, why does Snowflake have nine times the market cap now of Upstart when they are technically growing slower? I would argue the total addressable market might actually be smaller for Snowflake than it is for credit. I mean, credit is a multi, multi, multi trillion dollar market globally across personal, auto, mortgage, student loans, credit cards, small business lending. I mean, you're talking trillions upon trillions. Um, 
you know, data warehousing is not that big of a market. Total software, enterprise software might be, but not what Snowflake does uh, specifically. So, and Snowflake is just bleeding money out of their nose. So I, I'm sure this might piss some people off and that is fine. I don't care who I piss off anymore, but there is no freaking way that Snowflake should be worth $58 billion with those numbers when Upstart is now going to have more revenues, growing faster and way better margins and profitable. So I will, <laughs> I will, I will take that argument to the grave because that is now that I'm thinking about that, I'm just laughing, laughing my ass off because uh, it just makes me realize how undervalued and underappreciated Upstart really is right now. I mean, this is this is literally the they just came public in December. This just went red. Inning. They just went red oh, on the day. Funny. That's all right. I have more cash coming tomorrow, so I'll just buy more. <laughs> um, actually, I think I have a little cash. Hold on, I'm just going to buy some right now. <laughs> Uh, let me just buy some real quick. All right, I'm I'm doing it too. I got I got no problem buying more upstart. I just got filled at eighty nine seventy seven. So bring that shit on all day long. I'll just keep buying. I mean, this isn't even buying the dip. I mean, uh, I only got partially filled now. There we go. What was that at? Uh, eighty nine seventy. So yep. I mean. Is this buying the dip? Is this catching a falling knife? I don't know. I don't even care. Like I've done my models for Upstart. The numbers that they reported yesterday blew me away, blew everybody else away. There was a reason why the stock was up 26% pre-market. Um, you know, I, I thought this company could do $3 billion in revenue in four years. I would not be surprised if they end up doing it even faster than that now, just on their run rate. I had some joker on Twitter say, oh, this is going to go back to the gap. Shut up. This thing is not going back to fill the freaking gap in the 60s. The stock could be trading at eight times sales with 160% growth and 84% gross margins. That does not happen. I mean, every fund manager I know would load up the boat before it got down to, to, to fill that gap. I also had some other jokers say, well, what about the estimates for next year, 30% growth? I mean, even if it, even if the estimates do say 30, and I think they actually might, cle- let me just, hold on, let me just pull up upstart. Uh, yeah, 30%. I mean, companies don't go from 158% growth down to 30% growth. Sorry, it doesn't happen that way. So the numbers for next year will absolutely positively come up. I also posted today on Twitter that, you know, there's like six or seven analysts that cover Upstart. Only two of them raised their price targets today. The other jackasses haven't even raised their price targets since January. So I would love to have a a, a four-way conversation with these idiots from Goldman Sachs and Jeffries and I think it was JP Morgan that haven't updated their numbers since early December when the company actually reported Q4 numbers in March. So I'd love to talk to an analyst and find out, okay, a company reports numbers in March and now it's May and you haven't even updated your numbers from five months ago after two reports now. So, I mean, just, yeah, sometimes I do say, oh, the, you know, like I will promote a, a price target increase of one of my stocks, but like at the end of the day, half of these analysts don't just don't deserve their jobs. They do an absolute piss poor job of, you know, keeping up with the numbers or they just chase prices around. You know, if it's like if a stock goes down 30 percent, of course, they're going to change their price target. I mean, it doesn't mean that anything's changed with the fundamentals. It's just, you know, they don't want to look silly having the highest price target on a stock that starts dropping. So. Yeah, I mean, overall, nobody should manage their portfolio based on what the analysts say. I have five-year models on all of my stocks, or at least my top 10 holdings. So, you know, Upstart, Futu, Dermtech, Celsius, uh, Aterian, Clearpoint, Derm, um, Desktop Metal, Intrusion, Dario. Those are my top 10. I have five-year models on all of them. You know, where I think revenues can go, where I think gross margins can go, net income margins. You know, and then you start to work backwards. And that's why I just have no problem adding to Upstart today. I have no problem adding to Futu today because if these stocks do what I think they can do over the next five years, I'll make plenty of money. So these these are good buying prices to me. I don't know. Maybe they go lower tomorrow. Doesn't really. It's not going to change my life one way or the other. My mom said to tell you that she just bought another six shares. <laughs> She's on. Hey, you, you didn't buy mine. She's got she's got over 130 shares, so not bad. Cool. Nice. No, uh, one's, no one's buying these shares off me. I mean, honestly, I actually debated today whether or not I should just go 50% in upstart if it pulled back. I mean, it is my biggest position today. I'm not going to say how big, but it's it's pretty meaningful. Um, but it's it's probably big enough. I mean, any bigger right. than this, and I'm probably I'm probably not 
like managing risk risk very well in my portfolio. But you know, my top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, my top eight positions are basically ninety percent of my portfolio now. Right. Got it. Got it. Well, fun. Always fun talking upstart. Um, so real quick, I uh, just want to say thank you to we have now, I believe, over 400 listeners on here. So that was kind of the number we were on last week, around 450. So thank you to everybody that's tuning in. Um, love talking stocks with you, asking you all questions. We got uh, dozens of questions submitted, which was awesome. I think last week when we were doing this, Jonah, around the same time, I was trying to make a push for 7K, pushing for 10K now. So thank you for everyone that's joining mine. We're going to continue doing these um, as well, um, these calls, and just trying to bring um, valuable information to the community for free. I think that's really the goal here. So I have another question, and this is might not be totally within the wheelhouse, but I just wanted to hear, um, you know, there's been more usage lately, I think, of options and newer traders getting into options. Uh, do you use options at all? If so, for what purposes and use cases? If not, what are your thoughts on them? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not a big options guy. Um Last year was a great year to use options because you had all the the stimulus money. Uh, Markets were going higher. Um, So if you were going to play options, last year was the year to do it. I mean, this year, when you get into a choppy market um, or it's just less, I don't know, less certainty over the direction. I mean, you can really blow up your accounts using options because, you know, with options, yes, you get a lot of leverage. So if you're correct, you can obviously make a lot of money. But time is your enemy on options. I mean, the worst thing that you can do is, you know, have your options expire worthless and, you know, you're out of all of that cash that you paid for the premium. So I very, very rarely play with options. Um, I mean, about was it two weeks ago when I thought maybe we hit the bottom in the markets. I did buy some June 18th options, call options for Atarian and Upstart. Uh, Those Upstart options were up 100 percent this morning. And now they're down 8% on the day. So that just shows the type of volatility that you can get out of options. Um, I mean, neither one of these expire for another five weeks. So I really don't care what, you know, what they're doing today. But I, I, I think the best way to use options is just as protection. So buying put options or, you know, selling options for the income. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if someone's looking for like really good options advice, I'm definitely not the one. 99% of my account is always going to be just, you know, long equity only. Got it. Got it. So we got some, definitely some people are messaging me. This is, in, this is in, fun. Invest, but... Investing is, investing is stressful enough as it is. Adding options just increases your stress exponentially. And that's, I just don't need, I don't need to be living that way where, you know, wondering if my stock, you know, what, because those the intraday moves um, or the daily moves, you know, really change those option prices, um, you know, way more significantly than the underlying stock. So, you know, you can you can really drive yourself crazy by playing options. You really better know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to blow up your accounts. Right. One thing I will say with the options is you'll notice uh, basically it seems like 85 percent of the time you're kind of losing when you're buying calls, which is really what most people are doing. Um, however, if you're losing, that means that someone is gaining, they're selling them. Um, I actually did post this morning a full podcast I did on selling covered calls. Um, so if you're having terrible experiences with options all the time and you're buying calls and you're just losing money, you might want to check that out and maybe be on the other side of that. Also, I'm getting some DMs. This is awesome. People are like buying upstart as you're talking, Jonah, a uh, large Good. amount, large amounts of it. Those are smart um, people. Uh, also, some of my friends are in here. Uh, Uncommon Yield is in here, and he wanted to hear your thoughts on Latch. It's TSIA, and do we see it come back with the housing boom? So, back, just what, so I want to pull, uh, I'm not going to, let me see if I can find my model. Um, I, I, I mean, so back to Upstart, like, I honestly think this is an easy, 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 and, you know, don't sue me if I'm wrong. This is just my opinion, like everything else I say. Um, Upstart to me is an easy $300 stock by the end of next year. Uh, if they can do 650 this year, they easily do a you know over a billion next year. I'd say if they can do 650 this year, I wouldn't be surprised if they can do. You know, let me see, 1.1, 1.2 billion next year. You know, you throw on a, I don't know, I mean, a 20 multiple, 20 price to sales multiple on that, and you have an easy 300 dollars stock. So that's kind of, I mean. I'm just going to keep buying upstart. Like I've, I don't know if I've had this much conviction in the stock in the short term. Like I think 
over the next five or 10 years, I still think maybe Derm Tech could be my best performer. But in terms of like the next 12 to 24 months, hands down, Upstart is my favorite stock. So just to be clear. Um, well, you just made it. Uh, okay. well, you just made it. your question. You just made a quick 3% on Upstart. But I know we're not in it for the short term. We're listening. <laughs> Listen in long term. I mean, if I if I didn't sell any upstart this morning when it was up twenty six percent, I sure as hell ain't saying up selling it up three percent. Right, right. Uh, so the question was from Uncommon Yield, and he wanted to hear your thoughts on Latch, which is ticker symbol T S I A, and if they come back during the housing boom. So here's the thing: um, there's a couple stocks out there that I'm watching. Latch is one. Uh, View is another. So View Glass. Um, I don't know if anyone knows that one. That company also came public last year via SPAC, recently converted. Uh, they need new construction to come back. Um, it's not, you know, like my company, SoundGuard, where we made the soundproofing paint and actually business is actually starting to pick up again, which is nice. Um, we're going after renovation projects where hotels are renovating their existing properties, you know, which is a, something they do every six to eight years just to keep them, you know, refreshed. Um, companies like Latch, I, I think, I mean, I I could be slightly wrong here. View definitely needs new construction to come back. Um, Latch, I assume Latch, I mean, the reason I think they need new construction to come back is it's such a long lead time. And typically products like that are being specced in by the architects and the designers, unless Latch already has a relationship with the development or the owner, the ownership group of the building. Um, what do they call themselves? Not a, a security system. Uh, I forget what word they use. I haven't, I haven't looked through their investor presentation in the last couple of months. So I just forget the terminology, but uh, you know, b- b- keyless entry, like that's sort of what they're doing. So if you lived in an apartment building that had latch, you know, you could get into your, your unit, get into the building. You could basically do everything, you know, through the iPhone app. Um, but like, I don't see, I don't know if older buildings are going to retrofit their properties with, you know, new hardware and software. I feel like it has to be new construction, ground up stuff. And I just don't know if if our country is building new properties yet. I mean, like I, I, I know the hotel side and the hotel side is still, you know, they took such a financial hit last year that most of them have postponed their new construction projects because they want to wait to see how quickly travel comes back, especially business travel, before they start building new properties and adding new properties to their portfolio. And that's why they're starting to get back into renovations, because rather than go out and build a new property, they'd rather renovate the properties that they already have, um, you know, give them a new fresh look, feel, maybe even put a new name on the building, et cetera. Um, you know, back in when the pandemic started, a couple of our big customers at SoundGuard were large apartment developers. And most of them, I mean, these were like, I shouldn't say large. These were like mid-size apartment developers down in Texas um, and California. They actually went bankrupt. So I, I just, I don't know. I don't know where the state of the new construction industry is. So I don't know what that does to Latch's pipeline. I mean, I love the company. I love the product. I think there's a huge potential down the road for this company to do well. I, I just, I'm not ready to own the stock right now. Not until I, I also want to see them, um, you know, switch the ticker, you know, convert or de spac. You know, we've already, we've seen all of these SPACs have traded like absolute crap in the last couple months. A lot of them actually breaking NAV, meaning dropping below $10. Um, and it just seems like a lot of them are just kind of stuck in the mud in that, you know, $10 range. So it'll be interesting once they de spac, you know, whether that NAV support disappears. And some of these companies actually drop below, like I think you saw with Clover and even View. I think View got down to like eight dollars the other day. So uh, I'm just not ready to pile into these spacs yet until we see them start trading, uh, you know, as a pu- public company with their own ticker. Right. Um, right. Got a pretty good question that came in um, from Dan E, who's a at SAS underscore investor. They said, what catalyst do we need for the growth market to turn around? Uh, they don't see momentum changing course without a meaningful market catalyst. Actually, views views now under $7. Holy smoke. So that's that's what can happen to some of these SPACs after they de-SPAC when investors maybe start to realize that the that the projections, the financial projections in the investor presentations uh, maybe were not as likely as reality. So, you know, that may not be the only reason that view has been selling off, but 
um, you know, once that $10 NAV disappears, you can see how some of these stocks start to trade afterwards. But, you know, that's just that doesn't mean it's going to happen with every every SPAC or every company. I mean, I still like Latch. I still like Matterport, uh, Line Electric, Proterra. I mean, there's a whole bunch that I still like. Uh, I'm just not ready to pile into them yet. Um, OK, that question about, you know, what's it going to take to get growth to turn around? Yep. So. Yeah, I mean, this is a tricky one. Obviously, inflation is going to be a bitch. Uh, the 10 year treasury is going to be a bitch. Um, I don't know where they're going. I mean, I'm not a macro guy. I was expecting to see a high CPI number today. Obviously, that's what we got. We saw the 10 year tick up. I don't track the 10 year religiously. Like, I'm not staring at it all day long. I know it's in like the 1.65 range, probably. Um, you know, there's CPI, there's PPI. Uh, I couldn't even tell you all the factors. Uh, in each one. Um, but then like, I know a lot of times CPI gets reported as X food and energy, which doesn't always make sense. But then I think housing and used cars might also be in there. But like, I don't know, that doesn't, <laughs> to me, that doesn't necessarily make any sense. Because, you know, right now we're dealing with a, a car shortage. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, auto manufacturers that have had, you know, that have been uh, reducing their manufacturing numbers like Ford. I mean, Ford said they're going to make 1.1 million less cars this year uh, because of the chip shortage. So that's driving up the prices of used cars. I heard Jim Cramer today say that, you know, at, he's heard that at auctions, you have Ford 150s going for uh, higher prices than if they were actually new coming off of the lot. So, you know, I, but I don't think that's I don't think that's a permanent thing. You know, housing. I mean, housing numbers are ridiculous. I mean, I just gave my an, antidote um, of what it's like on Cape Cod trying to buy a house. And I mean, prices are probably up 20, 25 percent from a year ago, which is just ridiculous. That's not sustainable either. So, you know, all of the factors that are in CPI, I don't I just don't know how how many of them are sustainable. I still think that um, technology and innovation is very deflationary, which can offset a lot of these you know, these input costs. I mean, for instance, uh, the paint that we make, uh, that I make at SoundGuard, uh, our raw material costs have gone up um, by about 20 or 25 percent in the last few months. Now, I don't think I don't think they're going to stay there. You know, there's just there's supply chain issues, there's raw material issues. So, you know, the companies that we buy our stuff from, like Dow Chemical and Eastman, uh, they've had to raise their prices. But I don't think that's a permanent thing. But, you know, we are we are certainly feeling it in the short term. So, I mean, there's definitely inflation all over the place. I mean, I'm not going to argue that. I just don't know how long of it is going to is going to stick around over the next, you know, six to 12 months. And if it's something that we should just keep worrying about or, um you know, we'll, we'll just, we'll learn to deal with it. Um, I mean, growth. So, I mean, I still think there's like different categories of growth, right? My, my focus is small mid cap growth um, where I think valuations based on future growth numbers and earnings are very reasonable, but of course that's me. And, you know, maybe I'm not giving it a, a, a like a, a fair, I don't know, independent, uh, perspective. Uh, you know, I'm obviously talking my book here. You know, if you look at large cap growth, like I still think there's a lot of companies that are overvalued. I do think valuations got stretched so much last year that we still haven't worked through all of that, that we're still going to, you know, either uh, prices have, you know, uh, stock prices have to come down or fundamentals have to improve, um, you know, or we just keep, you know, grinding sideways or grinding lower for a while until, those fundamentals catch up to the valuations. I mean, I, I still think there's a problem with growth companies, large cap growth companies, primarily software, but I mean, all across large cap growth. And I'm not talking FANG because I think FANG is actually pretty reasonably priced, um, you know, especially when you start to back out the cash. But um, there's a lot of large cap growth stocks that are still trading at 25, 30 times sales with you know, 30, 35 percent, maybe 40 percent year over year revenue growth. Um, that's just to me, that's still too expensive. Those companies. Um, like, I think those I think those multiples could still contract another. I don't know. 25, 30 percent before they before I would I mean, not that I'm even looking to buy them, but before they would even make sense to me versus I mean, I'll just go back to Upstart. I mean, you, you can't even compare a software company trading at 30 times sales with 40% growth to a company like Upstart that's growing at 160% trading at like 
12 times sales. I mean, like they're not even in the same universe right now. Upstart is so freaking cheap. Like I'm just going to keep pounding the table on it because it's almost unlike anything I've ever seen before. I don't know if I've ever seen a company growing at 160%, 84% gross margins, trading at 13 times sales when you back out cash, just insane, you know, compared to the rest of the market. Um, I also think you start to look at some of these value stocks and they don't really make sense anymore. I mean, there's a lot of value stocks or, you know, these recovery companies, the travel names, infrastructure, oil and gas, like a lot of these stocks are now 50, 60, 70 percent higher than they were pre pandemic. And most of their businesses haven't even come back yet all the way. So to me, that doesn't make sense either. I mean, the rotation out of growth into value, I mean, for the companies that are blowing out numbers, um, you know, for instance, a couple of days ago, a company called Shockwave Medical, ticker symbol SWAV, um, you know, they were pointed, they, they reported really solid Q1 numbers, but they raised their guidance on the year to, I believe it was 188% to 200% or 202% year over year growth. So the midpoint was 195%. 195% year over year growth. I mean, that's one of the few companies that's actually growing faster than Upstart, but they're also trading at like 30 times sales, but with uh, 75% gross margins. But I mean, just like just in, insane. So the the, uh, the stock was up 20% yesterday and rightfully so, you know, because of that monster raise on 2021 guidance. So I don't know, man, this is, I mean, this is really a, just a bizarre market. I mean, I, I didn't do a lot of profit taking in February because I didn't want to have to pay a lot of short term capital gains because I thought we would get a 20, 25 percent pullback and then I could just buy the dip. I mean, I got blindsided just like a lot of other people. I did not expect a lot of these companies to drop 50, 60 percent. And I was out of the big cap, you know, the large cap growth names. I had already sold, you know, my Shopify, my Zoom my Roku, my Fiverr, my CrowdStrike, my Fastly, my Cloudflare. I mean, I was in all of those names, Peloton, great companies, but I just thought they, you know, valuations were too stretched. I mean, wait, a lot of those companies were up 200, 300, 400, 500 percent last year, but revenues were not up even close to that much. So it was, you know, 80 percent of that um, stock appreciation was from multiple expansion, not revenue growth. And that's where you run into a problem because as soon as you start to see deceleration in, in revenue and earnings growth, those multiples contract really fast. So I actually timed it correctly and got out of large cap growth at the right time and got into small cap and small cap went on a great two month run. And then my problem was just not getting out of small cap fast enough. You know, we're not, not trimming fast enough. Um, I under, I didn't appreciate how much how much enthusiasm there would be to uh, to you know to chase the recovery stocks. That just it still blows my mind how many people are willing to just pour money into you know the airlines and the cruise ships and the oil and gas companies. Like I don't know. To me, that trade looks way overdone. I just don't know when it ends and when it starts to snap back the other way. Mm-hmm. So that was a very very nice um, breakdown on really the whole sector for a second. Oh, I could have just summed it up and said, I have no idea. I mean, I really, I I just have (laughs) no idea when, when growth comes back in favor. I think there's a lot of names that are oversold. Um, And then some just valuations were just so, so stretched. I, I, yeah, I will say from a technical perspective and not that I'm a huge technical analysis person there. I mean, if we have another week like this week, we're going to be hitting a ton, a ton of support lines. Um, I mean, mo- most of these stocks are already at or below their 200 day moving averages. Uh, uh, some of them, are, it's really looking like the next week is really like kind of where many of them are going to hit if, they, okay. if it continues I mean, like this. Yeah, I mean, I, there's definitely, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to find any stocks that are still above their 50 day moving average. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can't remember a time where this many stocks were. Um, right. you know, this close to their 200 day moving average or in many cases below their 200 day moving average. So, I mean, I'm supposed to do a webinar tomorrow with trend spider and go through some charts. I'm not even sure what charts I'm going to use because they all look so horrible. Yeah. You might have to, might have to look at some of the value stocks. <laughs> um, <laughs> also shout out to everybody that's posting. So parrot, uh, said that after, you know, listening to you, he sold the rest of his snow and just rolled that into upstart. Uh, yeah, soul souls on here too. She just commented that she sold her Roblox at a profit and threw it all into Futu. Uh, she, <laughs> she 
So we're definitely, we're making money moves. Also, I would be remiss if I did not say to the 500 plus people on here, thank you for setting another record for our Q&A calls with Jonah. Um, we're definitely going to continue keeping this rolling. If you enjoy uh, stock market analysis, equity analysis, um, spaces, uh, I will continue to bring you spaces with all of your favorite creators weekly. I literally lost my voice last week. I spent so much time on spaces. Um, it's my full-time job. I spend like 10 hours a day on Twitter just trying to set up stuff for value all for free. So if you join um, and you're following, I will continue to bring that value to you every single week, um, hopefully every single day. Um, so Jonah, we're getting a bunch of questions coming in on a and, lot. And what, what, one more thing. So this is actually interesting as well. This is actually good news. I didn't even realize this. Um, upstart, someone was uh, was chirping on my, my timeline this morning that there's a big lockup coming for Upstart, you know, six months post IPO. But according to these um, the chart that I'm looking at right now, uh, VC firms only, they own 6.9% of uh, upstart shares. So I don't think you're, I mean, you know, even once that lockup uh, comes and goes, I don't think you're going to see a lot of selling, uh, you know, nothing that's going to, uh, you know, cause any damage to the stock price. I think there's plenty of institutional investors that are willing to step in. So this says 37% institutional ownership, 20, 21% general public, 18% hedge funds, um, 17% in, uh, individual insiders, and then only a uh, little less than 7% for VC firms. So that's actually better news than what I expected on Upstart. All right. I, I like this comment. By the way, so people, if you throw me like some spice with your comment, it's probably a little more likely to get in here. So this one's good. They said, let's get Jonah on ATER while he's riled up. Yeah, so I, mean, I spoke to management of uh, ATER yesterday, which is a Terrian, which is the former Mohawk. Um, you know, there's a few reasons why they changed their name. Mohawk is is actually a flooring company, so I don't think they wanted to be uh, included in that um, confusion. Um, you know, they're also doing a lot of M and A right now, so you know, I I don't know. I mean, a Terrian, I guess to them it sounds like a cool name. You know, they're just trying to create their own brand. So if anyone's not familiar, so Atarian, uh, I think the market cap right now is maybe around 450, 500 million. It was as high as a billion back in February when the stock peaked at about 48. So I did a write up on my sub stack of Mohawk when it was still Mohawk back in December when it was a $12 stock. And then the, <laughs> the thing rallied all the way up to 48. So, I mean, literally 4X in like eight weeks, maybe 12 weeks. Um, and then it pulled all the way back. You know, it started pulling back with the growth. Um, and then uh, then the news came out that they were refinancing their debt with some hedge fund at 8% plus warrants. And a lot of people thought that that was too expensive. Uh, then they got hit with a short report. So it was like a whole string of, you know, bad news, like the perfect storm for the company. But I still believe in what they're doing. Um, I trimmed 10% of my position today, but that was only so I could buy more upstart. You know, my conviction in the company hasn't changed. My, you know, thoughts on their their strategy. So it's kind of a it's kind of a two-piece strategy. No, we'll say, well, yeah, two. Um, they they own okay, so they 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 create and grow their own brands. Um, so they have, I think, 13 or 14 different brands right now. Uh, about two thirds of which they've started themselves. So what they do is they use AI or they use their proprietary software called Amy, um, which stands for AI. Uh, was it e-commerce? No, it was artificial intelligence. I don't know. Fuck it. Yeah, I don't care right now. Um, anyways, they use Amy to help determine where there are opportunities on prim primarily Amazon's third seller marketplace to, uh, develop products to meet a, you know, growing, you know, growing demand where there is a lack of supply from, you know, highly rated sellers. Uh, and then they work with their supply chain overseas, primarily in China, to design and develop these products, get those products, you know, shipped over and uh, loaded up in Amazon's warehouses within six months, and they can start selling them pretty quickly and, and try to fill that need. So, and it, it, it went very well. I mean, the company is, is growing their top line. They're growing organically. Then the second part of that is uh, M&A. So there are over 6 million third-party sellers on Amazon alone. And I will say that um, Atarian is also selling on Walmart's marketplace and even on target.com as well. So they're not, I mean, they are still like 85, 90% Amazon, but they are trying to diversify. Um, 
So the M&A part, and this is where, you know, the stock price falling is probably going to hurt them a little bit in the short term because they're not going to be able to issue more shares uh, to do M&A. They're going to have to wait until they can get a larger credit facility from a tier one bank. So that's kind of their primary goal right now is to try, you know, because 8% plus warrants is not really cheap and it's hard to justify going out and making accretive acquisitions with some expensive debt. So if they can have a tier one bank refinance for them at, let's say, five or six percent, um, which they should be able to do since the company is profitable. Um, and, you know, and they're and they're using that debt to go out and buy uh, profitable companies at reasonable multiples. So, you know, historically, they're going out and buying companies at let's call it five to six times earnings. And then they are stripping out 80% of the fixed costs. That's their goal from the words of the CEO. So, you know, recently they bought Squatty Potty. I know a lot of people probably know the name. They were on Shark Tank. Lori Grenier invested. Um, I actually interviewed the CEO of Squatty Potty like five years ago when the company was at like 30 million in lifetime revenue. When Atarian bought them a couple of weeks ago, I believe they're at like 165 or 175 million dollars now in lifetime revenue. So very, very successful consumer product. Um, I mean, basically a brand like you don't you don't go on Amazon and look for a pooping stool. You look for a squatty potty, you know, like you would look for a Kleenex or a Ziploc or something else. So, I mean, they really own their you know, this entire category that they created themselves, but they also have retail relationships. So they're a big seller, you know, Walmart, um, Bed Bath and Beyond and a bunch of other places. And the CEO of Atarian said they are planning to continue selling Squatty Potty in retail and then perhaps start to have conversations about some of their other products that might also work in retail as well. Although he doesn't see retail as being a big opportunity at this point because he does, he likes being on e-commerce because they can use AI to, you know, be very dynamic with the pricing and opportunistic. And you really can't do that as much with retailers where you're locked into prices with them. Because if you're selling online cheaper than they're selling in the stores, they're going to get very, very pissed. So once you start to sell in retail, you know, you start to lose your ability to change the prices online, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of what, um, their AI model is actually doing for them on the back end. So it's, it's, I mean, the stock's been hammered. Um, you know, the company raised their guidance this year to, I think it was like 380 million in revenue with like 34 million in EBITDA. Um, I don't know the exact organic growth. I mean, they haven't done a great job at breaking out organic growth versus, you know, total revenue growth. But, um, you know, if, if I would become much more, I mean, I'm still bullish. I mean, it's still a, a decent, it's a, it's a high single digit percentage position for me right now. So that's, you know, somewhere between five and 10%. Um, I would get more bullish if they can get that credit facility in place, because if you can, if you can borrow money at five or 6% and you can go out and buy companies at, you know, five to six times earnings, let's just say you're buying a company for $20 million that does 4 million in, you know, net income. So five times earnings, and then you can strip out another, you know, million and a half to 2 million of fixed costs every year. Because I mean, Italian is really just buying the assets. They are not buying companies. Like I, I shouldn't even say that they are, cause that is, that is a misconception. They are buying assets. They are, they don't care about the people. They don't care about the marketing programs. They don't care about anything else except the assets. So that's the product. That's the IP. You know, that is their, you know, the reviews and the ratings and their supply chain and all of that stuff. So most of the people from these these companies that they're acquiring are not coming over to Atarian. And that's why Atarian is able to run such an efficient operation. And I believe their revenue per employee is somewhere like one point four million dollars, which is just ridiculous. I mean, it's hard to find other companies, especially at this scale, that have a revenue per employee of anything even close to 1.4 million. You know, a lot of larger companies out there are like 200 to $300,000 of revenue per employee. So 1.4 million just goes to show how efficient they are at, you know, running this model of acquiring brands. So that's really the best way. They're acquiring brands and assets and revenues and profits. They're not acquiring companies. They don't care about the people. No offense. They don't care about the office space. They don't care about any of that, that junk that, that they can strip out and you know make these acquisitions even more profitable. So I'm going to make a couple of calls on their behalf to some tier one banks that I know, that you know buddies that I have in the industry, and see if I can help them get this, um, 
you know, this credit facility in place faster. Because I think that's when the story, you know, really starts to come back in vogue is if they can get a, you know, $200 million credit facility in place to replace the old credit facility and then give them some dry powder to go out and keep doing these deals. Got it. Got it. Um, pretty cool that you're literally going out there and trying to change the trajectory um, of the I, stock. I do, I, I do this for a bunch of companies that I'm heavily involved in. Right. So, oh, yeah, I mean, if I have calls with the CEO or the CFO or investor relations, and I think, I, you know, there's a piece of my network that I can tap into to try to help them drive some business, um, you know, generate some sales leads, you know, that sort of thing. Oh, hell yeah, I'll do that. Absolutely. So, Jonah, we got about... I got about 15 minutes left because then I actually got to go get my second COVID shot. Um, so let's rapid fire through a few more. Um, so yesterday we had what seemed like a pretty good earnings call from PLTR, which has been a very hot topic and they were flying and then they gave it all back uh, pretty much came all the way back down to the high teens today. Um, I actually am looking uh, potentially at calls for 2021, but I haven't bought any and now I'm even more, off of the options trail. So we'll see what happens. But any thoughts on PLTR? I mean, I think long-term options are obviously safer than short-term options. I mean, they're not going to, they're probably not going to move as quickly for you, but uh, I would say they're less risky because you have more time to work with. I mean, so I'm not like, I don't follow Palantir very closely. Um, I know a lot of people on Twitter love it. And I rarely say bad things about companies that I don't follow closely or that I don't own because I would rather spend my time talking about the companies that I do like and explaining why I am bullish on certain companies. I'll never understand why people go on Twitter just to, you know, spend their time bashing other companies that people like to me. That just seems like a waste of time. But, you know, if we're looking at Palantir's numbers and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because I didn't see the report. Uh, I didn't listen to the conference call. But I mean, I'm just looking at ticker right now and it says. Um, you know, estimated revenues for this year are like 1.5 billion, which would be like 35% year over year growth. But didn't they, wasn't there a number in the forties yesterday? Was it, was it year over year quarterly growth in the, in the forties? I'd have to check. Somebody did tag me in a post. Um, um, special. Let me hold on. Let me just, I'm looking at quarterly now. So quarterly. Okay, so this, I mean, this is just off ticker. So this is consensus numbers from a whole bunch of analysts. These are not my numbers. Um, it's not showing me a year over year for um, Q1 and Q2, because obviously Palantir was private last year, Q1 and Q2. It's showing me 31% year over year for Q3 and 24% year over year for Q4. Uh, I have 40, no idea. 49% revenue growth plus 49% from 40% in Q4. Okay, so you know, maybe, so maybe that's ahead of expectations. So maybe that means that the, you know, the number that I'm looking at right now for full year 2021 is, is too low. You know, I'm looking at 1.47 billion, 34.6% year over year growth um, with gross margins at right about, you know, right under 80 or expected to be right around 80. So, I mean, I'm just, you know, real quick math. I mean, market cap, or let's use enterprise value of, of Palantir is, was it around 36 billion? I'm not sure. 36. So, I mean, right now off those numbers, that enterprise value, Palantir is trading at 24 times EV divided by sales with 35% growth. I still think that's too expensive. So mm. that's just me. You know, I mean, if now, if now, if Palantir reported numbers yesterday in the forties and they raised, you know, I don't know. Cause I literally, I don't follow this company. So please don't, don't believe everything I'm saying, but if they reported numbers yesterday in the forties and they raised guidance for Q2 and full year and 1.5 billion or 1.47 billion is too low. And it's, it's not going to be 34, you know, 34% year over year growth. It's going to be 40 something percent. Then, you know, then it's not 24 times, uh, you know, EV divided by sales, maybe it's 22 or 20. And in that case, yeah, it looks a little bit more reasonable, but, um, you know, if I'm going to pay 24 times sales, I want to see year over year growth for the next couple of years at at least 45 percent, maybe even closer to 50 percent. Can, can you speak to some of the other um, I guess this kind of just works into because you're just talking about revenue growth. Um, and this is very applicable to I think everyone in the crowd that's doing their research. Can you talk to some of your favorite financial metrics and ratios that are kind of like your go tos, maybe like, you know, top three, top five um, that you're always looking at and kind of you know, obviously you're more focused on growth stocks. So what ranges you're looking for typically? 
Yeah, I mean, it definitely depends, you know, on the sector, the company, the 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 growth stage of the company, you know, how early they are. You know, if you look at a company like Dermtech, um, where clearly on a price to sales multiple, Dermtech looks insanely expensive. Like I would never, never try to argue that. But if you start to look out a couple of years, you know, if if Dermtech's genomics patches for melanoma, squamous, um, uh, basal cell, right? Those are the three main forms of skin cancer. So right now they have the PLA and the PLA plus for melanoma. And then they have Luminate coming out later this year, which is going to be for, uh, you know, kind of diagnosing the UV damage on your skin and then carcinome next year. That's when the growth kicks in. So like, yes, Dermtech and other early stage growth companies, which includes a lot of SPACs, um, you know, recent IPOs, where if you try to look at the price to sales multiples right now, they look extremely expensive. But then you start to look out two, three years down the road where growth is, you know, 100, 150, 200 percent a year in some cases, then things start to look a little bit more reasonable. I mean, right now, you know, Dermtech, for instance, did six million last year in revenues, obviously nothing. But I mean, we're talking you know, like they just brought their product to market. I mean, there, there was no revenues before that because they didn't have a product. Um, and then I expect them to probably 3x, you know, worst case scenario, 2x revenues this year. So 100%, you know, maybe 3x. So you're talking 200% at that point. And then that's, and then we get into next year when we have a full year of Luminate and then a partial year of Carcinome, you're probably talking another 3x revenues on top of that, you know, and then that's how, you know, like when I have my five, my five year model for Durham Tech, and I think my five year average growth rate from 2021 to 2026 is like 160 percent a year, 170 percent a year, I think. Um, and that's how you get to a, you know, a 10 or 15 billion dollar company in, in 2026. Um, and that's but like I'm, I'm willing to get in now at 30, 35, 40 dollars a share and be, be on the early side rather than the late side and have to, you know, chase this stock higher, you know, once the big institutional players start to come in, um, mm-hmm. you know, what I'm, the first thing I'm always looking at is, you know, revenue growth. I mean, if you're a growth investor, I, I don't know why your eyes would gravitate to anything before revenue growth. Um, and then I'm typically looking at gross margins. Um, but that's where it really depends on the sector. Obviously, something like software, you'd want to see gross margins at least 60 percent, if not in the 70s or 80s. You know, a couple of days ago, I interviewed uh, Jack Blunt, who's the CEO of Intrusion, which is that small cybersecurity company that I got into. And, you know, they're they're the new launch they're The launch of their product shield is going very well. They said they already have 50,000 seats uh, accounted for after Q1. They're not all activated, but. He said that the margins on that business, even at just 20 bucks a seat, uh, you know, per employee per month um, is in the 70s. So, you know, that's what you want to see from a, you know, software company, something in the at least 60s, if not 70s or 80s. You know, you get into other sectors like EVs uh, and you're probably, you know, single digits to, you know, teens. I think Tesla's probably around 20. Um, you know, right now, Dermtech, you know, gross margins for this year are expected to be 20%. Next year, going to 40 percent, you know, year after that, probably 50, 60 percent. So, you know, they'll be able to grow these gross margins over time as they as they scale up their operations. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it's, it's, you know, revenue growth is always first. Gross margin is always second. Third is probably EBITDA. Um, and then fourth is probably net income. Um, and then obviously I'm looking at, you know, market cap and enterprise right. value, mm-hmm. you know, which is just you know, backing in or out the, the cash or the debt. So I don't think enough people probably look at the balance sheet to see how much cash or debt is on the balance sheet. You know, too many people are looking at when they do their price to sales, they're just looking at the market cash, but that can be very misleading if the company has a bunch of cash or a bunch of debt on the balance sheet. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, also, I will say I'm um, real quick to anybody that's requesting to speak. I don't typically bring up people during these calls. However, especially if I follow you, I'm very happy to ans- ask your question. Feel free to DM it to me. Um, all right. I got a couple more questions to get. Uh, we got another 10-ish minutes. So oh, some, some, someone just DM me. So Amy stands for Artificial Intelligence Marketplace E-Commerce Engine. Cool. 
the, the M was the M was uh, getting me stuck. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is a question which I'm actually pretty interested in. Also, I guess I'll just go through both of these. Uh, so the first one is um, just thoughts on gambling stocks in general, Penn, DraftKings, MGM, Gnog, uh, just that industry. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't have any current exposure to it. I mean, part of it just um, there was clearly an acceleration in. Uh, online gambling and sports betting in COVID, you know, where a lot of people didn't have much else to do. And, you know, the casinos were closed, Vegas was shut down. So it made sense that a lot of these companies were putting up strong numbers. And then my concern was, you know, once the economy reopens, once Vegas reopens, once people are, you know, spending more time at sporting events and concerts and just living their lives, you know, do they still want to spend as much time on their phones you know, doing online sports betting and gambling. And I just, I didn't, I didn't have enough conviction that people, you know, that the, the trends would stay as strong as they were in 2020. So I just decided not to have any exposure. Um, so I don't follow the stocks closely. I mean, I know Penn was like a three or $4 stock last March, and then it got up to like 130 or 40 or 50. I mean, just, just a monster return for anyone that got in early and stuck it out because, I mean, there were definitely a lot of pullbacks along the way. You know, DraftKings, I mean, once again, I don't follow the company that closely because it's just a slightly bigger company than I typically want to own. I think the market cap said, like, I think the market cap got up to $30 billion plus. I think maybe it's pulled back to 20 now. Um, let me see. I mean, maybe it's a company that I should take a look at. Uh, I mean, they are certainly one of the leaders in sports betting. Yeah, so the enterprise value is down to $16 billion now, right? The stock's pulled back into the low 40s i think it was in the 60s just a few months ago so i mean i think for me like i did look at DraftKings a few weeks ago um when it started to pull back and i just you know i started building a spreadsheet of all the stocks that were down 30 40 50 60 percent from their highs to see if i liked any of them the one that i liked the most that i took a position in and did a write-up on was desktop metal um and i mean I, I don't think we have time to spend another 15 minutes going through why i like desktop metal so much but um, that's you know, on that's quick. on the last one if anyone wants it we did a whole oh, okay. 10 minutes and it's all recorded oh, right. and if anybody wants by the way all of these are recorded they are both put onto my youtube and onto my spotify both of those are linked on my pinned tweet uh thanks for like 400 subs on the youtube and 150 on the spotify and this one's being recorded right now by one of my analysts josh melter so if you ever like i get a lot of questions about like dmtk and celsius and the reason i don't always ask all them is because we've actually answered most of them already and they're all recorded and you can check them out. So just for everyone to know. So, I mean, just the, the one more reason I like desktop metal. I mean, the company is innovating extremely fast. Last week they announced that they can do 3D, 3D printed wood in like a whole bunch of different styles with, you know, different wood grains, like just mind boggling. And then today they put out an announcement that they can now, they just got FDA clearance on 3D printing dentures, dentures, um, which look, they, they look like real teeth. They are stronger than ceramic. Um, so just like really, really cool. I mean, I'm actually going to talk to the CEO next week after they report earnings. And I'm going to ask him like, seriously, when do you change the name of the company? Cause desktop metal might've been great three years ago. Right. When you were only doing metal, but now you're doing all sorts of composites and polymers and wood, like, you know, the, the name of the company is a little bit misleading, but I mean, I just, I, I think 3d printing is just going to be such a massive industry over the next 10 years. You know, I'm betting on desktop metal to be the top performer because of the management team, the IP portfolio, their entire, you know, the, the diversification of their different products and machines and materials. So I love that company, but I mean, there's a lot of companies that pull back 30, 40, 50%. So I'm looking at a bunch of them. The thing that threw me off with that, with DraftKings was just, it's just the losses, you know, I mean, they're like revenues are growing. You know, I think it looks like revenues are going to be up 90% this year, probably 40, 50% next year. I mean, but they're still losing a lot of money. I mean, they may not be profitable for another two or three years. Um, and I don't know what their cash situation is. I mean, even if they don't have to raise any more cash, like clearly these sorts of companies are just not in favor right now. You know, investors are, just sick of investing in companies that are losing money for many, many, many years, unless the growth is just so astronomical that they can't ignore it. Like shockwave medical, for instance, right? I mean, if you're going to grow at 190% a year, then investors are willing to overlook the short-term losses. 
um, you know, on a company like draft, you know, and to shockwave medical, you know, they're the only ones that are doing what they're doing. I mean, there's plenty of other, you know, gambling and, and betting companies out there. So it's not like DraftKings is the, you know, the entire market. I mean, they have right. competitors with FanDuel, uh, you know, and now all these casinos are getting into sports betting. So, I mean, this industry, industry is going to start get start to get a lot more competitive. And, you know, that's going to drive up customer acquisition costs for everybody, maybe less so for Penn, because Penn has the built in, you know, customer acquisition channel called, called Barstool. So, right. Exactly. I mean, if I was, if I was going to bet on one or the other, that'd be really tough. I mean, I love the fact that Penn has, you know, kind of the, the you know, the dual approach with the, you know, brick and mortar casinos, plus the, you know, sports media and then the online sports betting and and barstool to drive that traffic but you know like when i think of sports betting you know DraftKings clearly has a much much bigger lead um uh, in this industry than penn has so right penn penn would probably benefit if they just changed also perhaps the name to something more aligned with barstool um i think would help them especially their ticker if they just made it dave they'd probably be <laughs> in pretty good position there or or uh, DT was it D D D T G yeah yeah Davy Day Trader <laughs> Global um so so real quick we probably have time for like two more questions I think so first off I just want to say Lamonti just posted and I retweeted it so if anyone wants to check on my page he said currently eighty nine percent of the S and P five hundred constituents are above their two hundred day moving average and sixty six percent are above their fifty day moving average um and he did grow- yeah but that's that's but that's S and P I mean like let's use you know, the NASDAQ, Russell. I mean, at least for me personally, yeah, NASDAQ, Russell, Russell growth. I mean, so I, I he did, he did that also. Um, he didn't say how many were, but he did also someone commented underneath and requested to see the Russell 2000 on the chart. So he did also do it with the Russell 2000. Um, Cause I, I saw someone post something today on Twitter. Yeah. And I, I think it was like, uh, like arc and arcs top 30 or 40 holdings. And I think only one of them is above the 50 day moving average. But I mean, that's good. That's right. obviously that's that's growth. I mean, that's a growth portfolio. You know, there's there's a lot more value stocks in the S and P than there is growth stocks. Right. They're they're doing pretty rough. Also, I'm getting more questions about what's been in past recordings. Um, I'm not going to go through every stock, but we've covered obviously all of Jonah's favorites. Um, I'm going to be more likely to ask questions about stocks now that have reported earnings because we're in earnings season. Um, again, I will try to get that recording up usually within 36 hours. Um, I always post it too. So if you're following me, you'll see it first. Um, I always post it and I tag Jonah um, and I put that up and we did it really quick last week um, that we got it up. So let's do um, these two last questions and we'll try to get through them in about seven minutes. Um, the first one is uh, Fubo is doing, has been doing a major short squeeze again. Um, they, they just shot up yesterday from 17 all the way up to um uh, almost 21 they slowed a bit today but that stock's obviously been all over the place any thoughts on fubo tv i i really don't follow it to be honest i mean it's on my watch list but it's just not a stock that i personally have any interest in cool. so yeah no worries i mean I, I i saw it was up big yesterday so you know kudos to the people that are still holding it it's been a pretty controversial stock for the last few months uh also i just got a question what are jonah's top favorites top five you can find that in all every past video we'll have that so check that. And also we've talked about pretty much all of them. I'll, I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say Celsius, Futu, DMTK, Upstart. And uh, that's probably top four. Um, and DM. Yeah. And DM. So I'm, I think I have. Uh, a te- yeah. A Terry is five, six, okay, so, six is Clearpoint. Seven is. So uh, speaking of Clearpoint, that. that's another question. That's one of the ones I wanted to ask was Clearpoint reported yesterday, right? Yep. Uh, yep. I mean, that's yeah. enough. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's frustrating. I mean, they put up a good number, strong growth. Their biologics and drug delivery was up like 60 percent, 61 percent, I think. So, I mean, the company is definitely uh, heading in the right direction. Uh, great leadership. You know, for anyone who doesn't know what ClearPoint does and they actually have a few other products that are in the pipeline right now that are pretty exciting, but may not be generating revenues for the next couple of years. So. You know, right now it's basically their ClearPoint Neurosystem, which is their MRI real-time imaging system for neurosurgeons to uh, conduct minimally invasive brain surgery, uh, DBS, which is deep brain stimulation, and then biologics and drug delivery. So hundreds, literally over a hundred different drugs in trials right now for, uh, you know, to treat different uh, neurological diseases. Uh, And it would be 
ClearPoint that would be the delivery system for all of those drugs, most likely, because there's really no neurosurgeon that I've ever talked to that would use anything other than ClearPoint to deliver drugs to the brain so they can see real time, you know, where those drugs are going and how much they're actually delivering. Um, it's just a much safer method for, you know, both the doctor and the, and the patient. So, you know, this is like a typical, you know, razor blade business model. Um, and they, you know, they got slowed down like a lot of other medical device companies um, or surgical devices. They got slowed down by the pandemic where, you know, a lot of procedures were not happening in hospitals or sales staff weren't allowed to go in there. You know, trainings weren't happening, that sort of thing. So, you know, as the pandemic ends, as things reopen, as life gets back to normal, I expect companies like ClearPoint to continue putting up very strong results, especially as some of these drugs, you know, get out of trials and, and start to get commercialized. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, we'll just kind of, I actually do have one more after this. So it is any semiconductor stocks that you like right now? The question was just specifically about ON on semiconductor, who I guess works with Tesla. No, I mean, I, I've just never been a semi guy for whatever reason. Uh, it's always kind of confused me. And I just, I never trusted myself to really pick the right winner in the space. So I, it's not even an industry that I follow, to be completely honest. And I think most of the best, you know, the best players in that industry are all much, much larger. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm still focused on smaller mid cap stocks, which are typically not semiconductor companies. Cool. And then I think a great question to end it on is expectations for CELH earnings tomorrow morning. Uh, is it tomorrow morning? I don't know. That's what I got in my oh. DMs. Um, are they tomorrow morning? Yeah, I, uh, I know they're tomorrow. I, I didn't, uh, I don't remember if they're tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon. I mean, very rarely do companies report before the bell, but they could. Expected um, to report on 513 before market open. Oh, okay. So interesting. Okay. So that means we got uh, Celsius before the bell and we got Derm Tech after the bell. So that'll, that'll be a stressful day for me and, and many others. Um, I think numbers are going to be good, you know, um, whether or not they are good, obviously we'll find out in less than 24 hours, you know, how the stock reacts. That's always a, a wild card as well. I mean, I've told the story for Celsius many, many times. I think a lot of people have heard it, but you know, we're, it, it's a three or $4 billion energy drink company that owns like 0.001% of the total adjustable market, which is currently $60 billion growing at 9% a year. So that takes us to about a hundred billion dollar TAM in five or six years dominated by Red Bull and Monster. But this is a game of distribution, you know, distribution, brand awareness, um, you know, store, you know, store placement, location, that sort of thing, you know, where you're actually situated on the shelves and the coolers. Um, and Celsius has done a really nice job over the last year of building up their, their distribution, uh, you know, for the first nine months of last year, they were primarily doing DTR, which is direct to retailer delivery. Um, but the problem is that means that those, those shipments are typically going through the retailer's distribution center or warehouse. So there's like an extra step. And, you know, then by the time that the product gets to the store, it's someone, it's typically an employee that has to stock the shelves. And that's not always happening very timely. So and a lot of times these employees don't stock shelves until end of day or overnight, like they do in my in my grocery store. But what Celsius has done uh, through the help of Bang, because Bang pissed off a lot of these DSD partners, is Celsius has partnered with over 150 DSD, which stands for direct store delivery. So 150 regional DSD partners from like, you know, these are like the guys that do, Bud, you know, deliver Budweiser and, and stuff. Um, and that's who Celsius has started working with. So these 150 um, partners are delivering product directly to stores. And they're the ones that are actually stocking the shelves every day and making sure that displays are set up correctly, end caps, all of that. And then Celsius is now rolling out these branded coolers because a lot, you know, something like 50 or 60 percent of all energy drink sales um, are grab and go out of convenience stores, gas stations, et cetera. So having Celsius in a cooler, um, you know, in a prime location in a gas station or convenience store is going to help that, that sales velocity. So, and I know when they, when they were, they mentioned the branded coolers on the Q4 earnings call a couple months ago, 
They said that they've delivered about 200 of these coolers so far into locations. And a lot of those locations said they've been seeing a 200% increase in sales velocity of Celsius when it was in the cooler versus it was just when it was warm on the shelf. Wow. Um, I've seen a lot of pictures on, on social media of uh, pallets and pallets and pallets of Celsius in Costco locations. Um, so I, I don't know, like, I think they're going to put up a strong number. I've seen some of the the week over week Nielsen data for Celsius, and it's like triple digit stuff. So I'm going to be shocked if they don't beat numbers tomorrow. I just don't know by how much. And because you can't just, I mean, converting from DTR to DSD is not like, you know, you snap a finger and 150 DSD partners are all set up with product ready to go. I mean, there is a transition phase there. So whether or not, you know, we see the benefits of that transition right away, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll get more, we'll get more clarity on the call tomorrow, but I mean, they they were at 82,000 stores by the end of last year. I expect them to be close to 100,000 stores by the end of this year. Um, They got almost no international growth last year because of the pandemics around the world. So I'm bullish on the company. You know, I think they're taking market share from Red Bull and Monster. Um, You know, you can see, I mean, anyone that's on Twitter regularly uh, or follows me can see all the people that are tweeting me pictures of their local grocery stores or Targets or Costco's, you know, as they're buying cans and cans and cans of Celsius. So, and I just, or, I just tried to order a case of orange Celsius off of Amazon the other day, and it's on back order right now. So, like, wow. the product is selling through pretty strong. Whether or not we see the results tomorrow, I don't know. Um, I almost, I, I mean, obviously, I want the stock to go up, right? But if it pulls back, I'm happy to add to it because this is a long-term story for me. Perfect. Perfect. So I'm just going to kind of wrap up and then Jonah, I'll give you the last word. So as always, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I am your host, Gav Blacksburg. I'm the CEO at Wolf Financial. Um, Wolf Financial, if you take a look inside of uh, my profile real quick, you'll see on my header, some pictures of the app we're building. We're building a basically FinTwit, but designed for FinTwit. So if you kind of wish that, you know, when you saw a really good stock and you're like, wow, Jonah's talking about CLH and they have 100% revenue growth and they have XX and X. And you're like, I wish I could just see all of their ratios right here. And I didn't have to leave Twitter and go to Yahoo Finance to download five years of data and make a shitty looking graph. And you're just like, I wish it was all here. Well, that's what Wolf is. And Wolf basically just brings you all in place. You can connect in your portfolio from pretty much any brokerage in the US or Canada. Um, so you can check that out. It's in my bio, a link to it. Um, you could probably get also your favorite username or whatever you'd like. So please do check that out. My CEO would be uh, angry at me if I didn't mention it. So definitely do that. And Jonah, it's always a pleasure having you on. Um, I learned so much from you. I know my listeners learn a ton from you also. Um, hopefully we'll do this again next week. Um, I'm going to be moving in the early part of the week, but hopefully we'll get it in the middle of the week. And any um, any last words for the listeners? Uh, no, I mean, no. I think you just got to figure out what kind of investor you are. I mean, I think a lot of people are, uh, panicking and reacting to short-term prices or short-term movements in their stocks. And I mean, if, if you were, you know, if you're a trader or you're looking to flip these stocks, you know, then that's fine. You know, for me personally, then the people that follow me, I hope you understand that I am a long-term investor and I am trying to build a portfolio of core holdings that I can own for the next two, three, four, five years. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to trade in and out of them a little bit in the short term or take profits once in a while. Um, but you know, most of the time my core holdings are stocks that I plan to own for the next three, four, five years. So, you know, thankfully I have some cash flow. I have, you know, I own several different businesses and then I have some other um you know cash flow channels. So I can keep adding to these stocks. So pullbacks probably don't impact me maybe as much as others, but you know, I just think too many people are getting swept up in this in this pullback and losing faith in stocks in general, or, you know, they love the stock at 80 and now the stock is 40 and now they're selling it and they hate it. And they're going to go sit in cash and wait for things to look better. And typically that means that, you know, when you start to get that sentiment, it means we're pretty close to finding a bottom. And the last thing you want to do is, you know, miss that bounce off the bottom and then have to chase these stocks higher. So, you know, I, I think this is a good time to go through your portfolio, you know, uh, sell out your your lower conviction names, take some tax losses, and then consolidate into your highest conviction names that you think have the most upside potential over the next six months. That's what I've done recently to my portfolio. That's how I like to manage money. So I'm down to 12 stocks in my portfolio that I believe have the highest potential over the next six months to deliver the best returns to me. Perfect. Couldn't 
Couldn't have said it better myself. Amazing, as always. Uh, Jonah Lupton, everybody, if you aren't already following, you are missing out on some of the best content that you will find on Twitter. So make sure that you are. We will be back again. Um, I really do think next week. Um, and also, I'll be having spaces all the meanwhile. I'm going to have a big space on Saturday going over ARKK's holdings, actually. So if that's something you're interested in, you can come check that out. That's going to be with some big accounts. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Jonah. And I look forward to chatting with you next time. You got it, man. Have a good one.